Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. The Lord is good and all the time. And there is no one like him. Nothing compares to his embrace. Hallelujah. Do we have a witness? My heart will sing. Sing about who? Jesus. Hallelujah. Please remain standing. Those of you worshiping online, thank you so much for joining. Wherever you are, if you can, if you can, please remain standing as we make our declaration of fruitfulness. It's amazing how far we have come in this year. Today is May 30th, and already five months um, is going to be history for 2021. So say after me, the eternal God is our refuge. He opens rivers and desolate heights. The Lord makes the wilderness a pool of water. The Lord God is my sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. Therefore, I delight myself in him. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall be fresh and flourishing. Do the earth be shaken? The name of the Lord is my strong tower. By faith, I affirm that in Christ alone is my salvation. In him I live and move and have my being. It is written, the righteous are like a tree planted by the waters, bearing fruits in a season. So I boldly declare, as for me, my God has made me a similar fruitful. In this season, my spirit bears fruits of righteousness. My talents make way for me. With my hands, I will plant, I will build, I will harvest. Day by day, step by step. In Jesus' name. And all shall say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And go to see you in church, please. Kindly take your seats in the presence of the Lord. And it's a joy to have you in person. Um, and those of you worshiping online, not all of us can be here. It's only 15% of capacity for now. And so we salute you um, that you continue to understand and you continue to worship with us online. Hallelujah. We are trusting that, as has been announced, very soon we are going to enter into step three and the entire restrictions will be lifted and so we are trusting that by by july 15 all things being equal we are going to see almost all of you in church um on sundays one of the things that have happened with COVID is that we now have an active congregation that is going to be in person and we are also going to definitely have people who are going to be online. Hallelujah. And so COVID has taught us that it's okay to worship online. But don't just worship online and, and, and neglect um, certain aspects of fellowship. Throughout this month, we have focused on missions and church growth. And I have been ministering on the theme, The Flourishing Christian. As I indicated last week, Today being the last day of the month and also our communion Sunday, I'm going to focus a lot on the church. I'm going to focus a lot on the church. So we've talked about the flourishing Christian and what um, that means. And today we are going to be focused on the church as I announced last Sunday. And so this morning, if you will, I am ministering on the theme, Marks. M-A-R-K-S, or qualities, marks of a growing church, or the qualities of a growing church, um, whichever way you, you like, marks of a growing church, or the qualities of a growing church. And after my ministration, we are going to be receiving the communion. This, of course, is loaded, but I'm going to um, run um, as quickly as I can, because I'm not going to continue um, from Sunday. The month of June is an entirely different month, 
and we are going to be um, running after a few things. Um, we are going to be starting our 40 days of power in the month of June, and I'll be giving you details next Sunday. And so I want you to please follow me closely. Um, on Friday, we are going to spend some time to discuss um, this message. And so I'm going to um, be as fast as I can and, 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 and we'll, we'll, we'll do an in-depth discussion of this on Friday, coming Friday. And that means that those of you, uh, Friday meetings have been improving, attendance have been improving. I want to encourage, there are still some of you that we don't st still see. We want to trust that if you are not working, you'll make the time and join us so we can get, um, we can have a meaningful discussion and a meaningful fellowship. So don't stay just after online and we d you don't show up. Make sure you call somebody, make sure you stay in church, make sure um, you connect with somebody. And so today I am going to be ministering from two key scriptures. Two key scriptures. The first is from the book of Acts chapter 2 and the second is from the book of Titus chapter 2. So Acts chapter 2 and Titus chapter 2. So please turn your Bibles with me to my first anchor scripture from Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 42 to 47. From verse 42 to 47. And Father, we ask, O oh God, that you will have your way as we sit under the ministry of your word, open our eyes, break open your word to us. Bring light, bring understanding, open your hand over this service, touch, heal, encourage, lift up, meet everyone at the very point of our needs, and may we never be the same today. In Jesus' name, amen. So marks or qualities of a growing church. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 42 to 47. And so as we read these, um, um, these two anchor scriptures, take note of what is bringing the growth Take note of what is, um, is what, what constitutes the various characteristics, the various qualities that we find about a growing church. I'm going to define for you what a church is, and that is going to be the boundaries for, for this thing. And so, reading from verse 42 to 47, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This, the background to this scripture is that the Spirit of the Lord came upon the early church in from, from verse 1 to 4 of Acts chapter 2. And they began to speak in tongues. They began to speak in languages that were known to the people at the time. And many people gathered. Um, and Peter preached a long message. In, and about 3,000 people got saved. And this is what this is the background. So people got saved, but those who got saved, the Bible said continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and prayers and all these other things continued. And because of all that, verse 47 says, um, and the Lord added to the church. And the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. And so those who are being saved were not um, left alone to be in their home, but they were added to the church. They were added to the church. This is our first anchor scripture. Turn with me to Titus chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. Titus chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. So this is Titus receiving instructions from the Apostle Paul 
And this is what Paul has to say to Pastor Titus, Minister Titus. He says, but as for you, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. That means that there are certain things that you can speak as a minister which are not proper for sound doctrine. Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Can I have from the congregation, if you are reading the Bible, definitely they will have a title um, before the verse 1. What is the title you have there? Can I sample from two or three people? Sergeant Lee? All right, but before the verse 1, do you have a title? In your, what, what is the title? He said, doing, doing, good. doing good for the sake of the people. Okay, thank you. What again? Qualities of a sound church. Any other? So doing good for the sake of the people, and then you are what? Qualities of a sound church. Now Paul says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. That the older men, and I have underlined older men, there are certain people we find in this church in the titles of pastoring. So Paul says, speak the things which are prophets for sound doctrine. Verse 2, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. And so these are some qualities that um, Titus is saying that speak in such a way that the older men in the church will begin to manifest these qualities. Manifest these traits. And technically, you look at them, they are all the fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. So speak in such a way that the older men will manifest this. Verse 3, I use this um, on Mother's Day. The older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior, no slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women. So from older men to older women, now we move to young women. That they admonish, and I define what the word admonish means on, on Mother's Day. And by the way, Father's Day is coming June 20th. Hallelujah. So Father, get yourself ready. So they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Verse 6. Likewise exalt the young men. So now, from young women, I like um, how Paul put it. He started with older men and then went to older women. And this time he didn't go to young men. He, he went to young women first and then comes to, um, to, to young men. What a balance. What a balance. What a balance. Likewise exalt the young men to be sober-minded. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. A doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Verse 9 Exhort born servants. So in the church that Titus was pastoring, there were born servants, they were slaves by choice. People who have finished their work, but they choose that. They are going to stay for the, with their master for the rest of their lives. And that is who we are as believers. We are slaves of Jesus by choice. Hallelujah. It's not the bond servants to be obedient to their own masters. So they were masters. To be well pleasing in all things, not answering back. No back talk. No back talk in the church. No back talk. No back talk when, when you are dealing with your master. Not preferring, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. I like verse 11. Verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And so in the church, we are all men. Everyone including our children, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, 
righteously and godly in the present age not in the age to come but in the world we live in now the bible says the grace of god that brings salvation to all salvation has appeared to all men and that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and well alas being soberly righteously and godly in the present day verse 13 looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great god and savior jesus christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works speak these things exalt and rebuke with all authority let no one despise you and so by definition a church is an assembly of people who have been called out of this world and who belongs to God. That is what a church is. It's an assembly of people who have been called out of this world and who belongs to God. And so when I talk about marks of a growing church, that is the, 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 the boundary. A church here is an assembly of called out ones. Called out people. People who have separated themselves from the world. They've given their life to Jesus Christ. And their life belongs to God. they committed to God. That is what the church is. That is what the church is. So, if we have a church where the people are not committed to God. They are not committed to the ways of God. They are not committed to the word of God and the things that God cares about. Is that a church? That definitely will be an assembly, all right, but not an assembly that God will be pleased with. Hallelujah. And so we are talking about the marks of a growing church. There are a number of assemblies, a number of gatherings that people are growing. But we are looking at a church. We are not looking at a club. We are not looking at just gathering. We are not just looking at people who are flocking into a particular group. That's what we are looking at. We are looking at the marks or the qualities of a growing church. And so I say this. A growing church, based on the two scriptures we have read, if they are doing everything, shows that that church is healthy. As human beings, when we compare the church to our lives, if we ensure to stay in health, growth will become automatic. Hallelujah. And so a healthy church at the end of the day is healthy. A, a growing church at the end of the day, sorry, is healthy. So for a church to grow, it has to maintain a healthy environment where certain marks or certain qualities or certain characteristics are manifested. For us, as I said, in our temple, what kind of a church do we want to become? Do we want to be a church that the Lord Jesus Christ will be pleased with? Do we want to be a church that will be committed to God? What kind of a church are we building? And today, as I conclude this series, with these marks of a growing church, I pray that God will help us to be able to strive to see these things happening in our lives. We saw some in the book of Acts chapter 2 from the early church and in Titus chapter 2 verse 1 to 15 we see other things. So, what are the marks or the qualities of a growing church? Ten key qualities. Ten. I'm going to Focus on 10 quickly. 10 quickly. The first one has to do with teaching of sound doctrine. Teaching of sound doctrine. Teaching of sound doctrine. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. 
The word doctrine means teaching. Teaching. The proper teaching of the scriptures. And so if the growth of the church, if the growth of the gathering is not based on the proper teachings of the scriptures, the members will never become committed to God. Because it's only the proper teaching, proper doctrine, that can make people commit themselves to God. And dare to be different. Anyone who is committed to God is godly. Anyone who has given his life to, I mean, the word Christians came um, because of the church in Antioch. They saw them and they were living like Christ. And so, teaching of sound doctrine is one key indicator of a growing church. If the church is growing in the true um, um, church of Jesus Christ, there is teaching of proper doctrine. There is teaching of proper doctrine. So I say this, continuing steadfastly to teach sound doctrine will definitely produce spirit-filled, committed, strong, and stable Christians. And they continue steadfastly without wavering. We live in a world today that is bombarded with so many anti-godly agenda, anti-Christian agenda. And if we don't take time to study these things and to study the word of God and situate some of these things properly, some of these agendas will infiltrate into the church. And once it does that, we cannot produce spirit-filled, committed, strong, and stable Christians. Commitment, I believe, comes first. Before any other thing. Without commitment, there is no church. Period. Hallelujah. If the people are not committed to God, then you don't have a church. It's as simple as that. You have a gathering. You have a club. You have a group. But you don't have a church. You don't have a church. So commitment to God comes first. And it's so important. Commitment to God, it comes first. And that is going to come from sound doctrine. And that is why in ICGC we believe in the word. It's the word that changes people. Hallelujah. We believe in sound doctrine. We believe in what we teach. Every platform in the church, we want to be sure that out of that platform, and by platform, I'm talking about every ministry thing. Hallelujah. Out of that is coming our sound doctrine. That which will produce spirit-filled, committed, strong, and stable Christians. Throughout this year and um, this month, we've learned that we need to grow to the fullness of the measure of Christ. We don't have to be Christians who are tossed to and fro. Sound doctrine will do that for us. Number two, meaningful fellowship. A growing church is a church that places emphasis on meaningful fellowship. We need to experience that. If the church is growing, there is definitely going to be fellowship. A fellowship basically is coming together with one mind and purpose. And that purpose at the end of the day must glorify Jesus. Hallelujah. And so they continue steadfastly in fellowship. A growing church experiences meaningful fellowship. Meaningful fellowship. Number three, breaking of bread. Today we have the opportunity to receive communion after this message. But when you read through the New Testament, you find that communion was something the believers celebrated in their homes. They moved from house to house, breaking bread. And I believe that breaking bread includes all the love feasts we do. Hallelujah. All the love feasts. 
as we fellowship in our homes, as we fellowship in small groups, what happens? You realize that when we come together as fellowship and there is no food, eh, sometimes it's not proper. <laughs> there has to be something. Food is something that connects us. That connects us. When somebody comes to your house to visit you, it could be five minutes, it could be two minutes, it could be three minutes. But I can guarantee you if you can convince the person to sit down and eat, you are going more than three minutes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You are going more than three minutes. Breaking of bread. Communion. But I want to emphasize a lot on love feast. Hallelujah. And so it's okay to open your homes. Especially when the restrictions are over. For people to come. As we plan to get into summer. Every year we have a church picnic. Where we come together. We... We, 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 we fellowship with one another and all that. But after the restrictions are over, I want to see more church picnics after, um, even, even, even in 40 days of power, invite people to break your fast at home. Hallelujah. I will break the fast, invite people to come and break, your, break their fast at home. But breaking up bread is so important. It's so important. We need to do that. We need to do that. And it doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't have to be something big. Do some sandwiches. Uh, try and do some. <laughs> Somebody said banku. <laughs> Do something, do something. Buy some noodles. Why? People are shaking their head. <laughs> you don't like noodles, so. Go to the hospital, just go and buy some noodles and so they, they, they do something. Fufu baku keke. Watch it. Breaking of bread. That's the third thing. Number four. So in that same order in Acts chapter 2, and prayers. So commitment to effectual prayer. And I'm just going in that order. But prayer is very, very key for growth. If you have a church that is not committed to effectual prayer, and effectual is the way. It's not just shouting in there. It's not just opening your mouth and praying hours and you yourself, you, you are checked out of that prayer. There are people who pray, 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 and by the time you realize they are binding Jesus and losing Satan. Because they are checked out. Hmm. Effectual prayer. And what is that? On Friday, we are going to be looking at that. What is effectual prayer? The Bible says the effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. The kind of prayer that is based on the word, down in faith. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. You read Acts chapter 1. Just even before the Holy Spirit came upon the people, they continued in prayer. 
guess what they were doing in the upper room before the Holy Ghost fell on them? They were together in one accord. Effectual prayer. And when we are praying a congregation kind of prayer, there has to be unity, there has to be togetherness. We, we, we must agree on what we are doing. Commitment to effectual prayer. There's a fourth quality you'll find in a growing church. Any church that is growing prayers. The Bible says they continue steadfastly. They met in their homes and they were praying. Yesterday I was sharing with the youth when some of us started. I have a sister, an elder sister who um, became an ICGC member just because of, of, of fellowship and prayer in the house. When I'm usually home, by the end of the day, the number of people that have gone through my house, so many, so many. But one moment you see us chatting, the next moment we are eating, by the time you realize it's prayer, it is worship, and sometimes we are on our faces, one hour, two hours, just praying and worshiping. And we're doing things that we were not instructed by a pastor to do. No. We were doing things because we were in the covenant family. Meeting every morning, don't and um, prayer. I know one sister who 3 a.m. she is knocking on your door. 3 a.m. And she is coming from about 30 or 40 minutes walk to come to your house to come and knock on your door. 3 a.m. and we are marching to go and pray. I will close the prayer sessions after 6 30 sometimes. Prayer. The church has to pray. And when we pray, God hears. Hallelujah. When we pray, God answers. Yesterday, as we fasted, our focus was ask, seek, and knock. When we ask, we receive. When we seek, we find. When we knock, it shall be open. But I like ask, seek, and knock. I like the progression. You ask. You go out of your way and search for it. And if you still not, you knock. Hallelujah. So you can ask, I want this. And a person will hear you. But you can also begin to move. And start looking for it. And you can also begin to persist and knock and knock and knock. Commitment to effectual prayer. That is the fourth thing you'll find in a growing church. And I pray that will be our story here in ICG South Temple. Amen. Number five, experiencing vibrant worship. A growing church is a passionate worshiping church. Vibrant worship. Our worship, and that is why I, I like what we, we, we have here. We are growing. Hallelujah. Don't check out what is worship. Our worship is more than singing, we know that. It's more than music, we know that. But the singing and the music is so important. Number six, a growing church encourages living a Christ-like a Christ life or a Christ-centered life. See, the grace of God has appeared unto all men, teaching us to what? Deny ungodliness, well alas, and every lawless deed. So deny every form of ungodliness. Deny every form of worldly lust. Deny every lawless deed. And surrender your life to God. Live a surrounded life to Christ. On a daily basis. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says, Remember the days of 
Remember your God in the days of your youth before the evil day come. Hallelujah. As a young person, you have to remember God. You have to remember the law and live for Christ. Remember to live for Christ. Live soberly. Live righteously. Live godly. And I like the instruction to Titus. He said, don't let anybody despise your youth. That means say and do what God wants you to say with all authority. Without allowing anybody to despise you. And the way to do that is show by example. Turn to First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. You are a Christian. So live a Christ-like life. And for those of us who are young, you can be a young person by influence adults. First Timothy 4 12 says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example. Be an example for the believers. Be an example to the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Paul is saying to Timothy, you know, don't go and fight all these people. They are the older men, the older women, the young men, the young women, the the ball servers, the master. Don't go, don't go and 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 fight for acceptance and for respect and all that. The way to do it is to be an example. Hallelujah. Live a Christ-like life. That is the way to do it. And when you live a Christ-like life, doors will be opened unto you. Doors will be open unto you. Living a Christ-like life means strive to become an example in everything and stay continually in faith and obedience because that is part of that. It says in faith. In faith. In purity. Be a man and a woman of faith. When others are saying it's not possible, say it's possible. Because with God, all things are possible. Have that kind of attitude. And let your life be an example. Be a model. Be a pattern. Be a pattern. Be a pattern. Number seven. A growing church is a church that equips members to win those defined on a mission field. To Christ. It encourages the members to win those they find on the mission field to Christ. I believe that growth in the church takes place when members addict or devote themselves to give birth to other members. Today we have drug addicts. Be a soul addict, a soul winning addict for the Lord. Hallelujah. Addict to yourself. Devote yourself to give birth to other people. Reach your family and friends. Pay attention to the people you find on the mission field, the people God brings your way and try and win them. Last Sunday, I closed with Luke 4, 18, Galatians 6, 1, James 5, 19 to 20, and June 1, verse 22 to 23. And I said on the mission field, we find 10 people there. And so let me run through these scriptures quickly. Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is Jesus. To the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, Recovery your sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So we find the poor, we find the brokenhearted, we find the captives, we find the blind, we find the oppressed. Every one of them have a need. 
And when you meet these people on the mission field, you need to learn how to be able to win them. Galatians 6 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. In a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest also ye be tempted. James 5, 19 to 20 says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, on the mission field we find all these people. People who have wandered from the truth. They used to be Christians. They used to be, to be, to be committed and, and, and then all of a sudden something happens and they, they, they wander away. And someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save the soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Jude 22 and 23. It says, And on some have compassion. As you go about your ordinary day life, there are some people you will meet, and the Bible says, On them have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear. There are some people you save with fear. Last, um, they were showing on the news about three houses that caught, caught, caught fire. And I just wonder, when I look at the fire in North Edmonton and all the three houses got burned and the other houses were, were affected as well. And I look at how the wind was blowing and the, and the house was totally on fire. And I ask myself, if I'm a fireman, <laughs> what am I going to be doing? But there are certain people you save, and you save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So, there is the poor. There is the poor. The word that was translated poor means the lonely, afflicted, destitute of the Christian virtues and eternal riches. It means anyone who is lacking in everything. Anyone who is helpless and powerless to accomplish an aid. Jesus says, I came for these people. And they need the preaching of the gospel. So when you find the poor, preach the gospel to them. They are people who are broken hearted. And their hearts need healing. And I believe the gospel is the key for any heart that is broken. A growing church is a church that encourages people to meet all these people and to Bring the word of God to them. The captives. They need liberty. They are bound. And as you go out there, if we want to grow as a church, we have to be a church that emphasizes on reaching out to those who are held captive. And they need liberty. And the gospel brings liberty. Jesus says, if I set you free, you are going to be free indeed because of the truth. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. As you preach the gospel, the truth of God's word to the people, it sets people free. The blind, both physically and spiritually, the gospel has the power to remove every veil and bring recovery of sight to us men who are blind. The oppressed, we find them on the, on the, on the, on the mission field, in our offices, as we go to the parks, as we go about our, our normal work, we find them. And we need to deliver and set them free. They are people who are perishing and dying. That's the sixth people, the sixth kind of people you find on the mission field. The perishing and the dying. We rescue them, we care for them. We rescue them, we care for them. The good Samaritan. There are people you find on the wayside who are broken and they are wounded that they have been left for dead. You save them. You rescue them. You care for them. Pay their hospital bills. Feed them. And there is the lost. The lost is different from the prodigal. The lost person is different from the prodigal. You look at the story of the prodigal son. The father didn't go out to search for the prodigal. The Bible says the prodigal came to his senses. And so for the prodigal, you pray for them. But the lost, you go out and search for them. So if you have 100 sheep and one gets missing, he is the lost. You leave the 99 and you go out in search of the lost. To save them. Because they are lost. 
They are people who are genuinely lost. They don't understand. They've allowed this world to infiltrate them. They've allowed the policies of this world, the agenda of this world, the ideologies of this world to cause them to err from the truth. And if you know that genuinely they don't know what they are doing, Paul was lost. Paul was, I mean, before he became Paul, he was so, he was completely lost. He was defiled. He knew he was doing the right thing, but he was totally lost. And God had mercy. Hallelujah. We need to find these lost people and we need to save them. There is also the weak. There are Christians among us, there are people among us, and they are weak. They are weak in faith. Weak. They are not as strong as you are. They are the doubting Thomas. Sometimes they doubt. How do we handle all these people? They, they are all there on the mission field. And so in the growing church, you are people who have been equipped, who have been taught to know how to handle those people. They are people who are fragile. They are people who are weak among us. How do we handle them? I can imagine when God called Moses to go and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. I'm sure they were, they were, they were, they, you know, they were doing their own thing because how come all those who left, only two, only two went to the promised land? It was those who were giving birth to. <laughs> so they were going and they were doing their own thing in their tents and, 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 and giving birth to. So can you imagine if you are supposed to be running with a pregnant woman who is um, going to be um, giving birth. They are all part of us. The weak. Compassion. Help. Encouragement. That's what we have to minister to them. The erring one. Point them back to the truth. And finally, the wounded soldiers. Those overtaken by sin. Those overtaken by sin. So we need to be able to spend time to minister to all these people. So that's the seventh thing. Seven characteristics. Seven um, mark you'll find in a growing church. Number eight, a growing church provides opportunity for members to use their gifts and talents to do the work of the ministry. So any church that is growing is a church of opportunity. When you are part of that church, you have the opportunity to use your gifts and your talents. You are not um, um, contained. You are not warehoused. Your gift is not warehoused. I like um, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. And I like the King James Version because of the particular word that is there. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Turn your Bibles with me to that scripture. It says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. The king says devoted. For you to use your gift, there has to be something that is driving you. The church can give you opportunity as we want. If there is nothing that is moving you to use that gift and use that opportunity, um, that, that talent, express that talent, nothing will happen. And so in the church, that's why you have people who sometimes don't do anything in the church. Don't they have gifts? Don't they have talent? Don't they have abilities? They do. Sometimes you can have a church which has an enabling environment, but still you have a lot more people who do are in the church and they don't do anything. And it's because of this. They are not addicts. Turn to your neighbor and say, be an addict. Be an addict. They said they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And that's where their gifts and their talents come to bear. Hallelujah. It's so, so important. Number nine. A growing church is a church that provides leadership and opportunity for small group and involvement. There has to be leadership. We need to provide leadership and we need to provide opportunity for small group involvement. I've said in this church, you can start a group. 
But as part of the process of starting a group, you need to write a proposal and convince why that group is important. And no group will start in this church if there is nobody who is committed enough to stand by and shepherd it and make it grow. Hallelujah. But there has to be leadership. Because if there is no leadership, I can guarantee you that group will start, but eventually they will lose sight. There are many people who have started churches today, and the question you ask them, why are you taking the people? They don't even know where they are taking the people. So you start right, but it's not how you start. It's not how you continue. It's how you start, how you continue, and finish. Hallelujah. And that's why leadership is so important. But there is opportunity for group, small group involvement. And finally, growing churches. And I believe this is so important. Know how to welcome and retain people. Every church has a front door and a back door. So every growing church should know how to open the front door to welcome people and close the back door. That means do whatever it takes to keep them and retain the people. Because when the people come and go, you are not going to grow. The Bible says the Lord added to the church such as is being saved. Growing churches have what it takes to keep God's babies and children. And so the question I close with, can God trust us as a church? Can God trust you as an individual? with his babies. Can God trust us as a church? Can God trust us as individuals with his babies, with his children? Every growing church know how to welcome and retain people. Will you allow the babies to die in your hands? Are we going to allow the babies to die in our hands? Are we going to allow the newcomers to die in our hands? What kind of a church are we building? And with that, please rise with me. Let's prepare ourselves as we partake of the communion. And those of you worshiping us online, please get a piece of bread and some fruit juice as we get ourselves ready um, to receive the communion. But you want to pray and say, God, help me to grow in health. Help me to flourish. Help me to flourish. As a member of the church, help me. Help me to do what it takes for the church to grow in the name of Jesus. As we partake of the communion today, you are asking that it will be a point of contact for the release, for the release, for the release of God's blessings. We have studied a lot in this month, missions and, 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 and church growth. We have studied a lot. We are asking that as we partake of communion, this grace is coming upon us. We've looked at what it means to be a flourishing Christian. And today we have looked at the qualities or the marks of a growing church. We're asking that these blessings will come upon our lives in the name of Jesus. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online, you are not born again. If you are here, you are not born again. We're about to partake of the Lord's table. The Bible says they continue. They continue the breaking of bread. It's an opportunity to dine with the Lord. You cannot dine with the Lord if you are not a believer. That is not sound doctrine. You have to first of all give your life to Jesus Christ. And that qualifies you to um, celebrate um, the, 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 the Lord's table. And so if you are not born again, wherever you are, I want you to bow down your head and can the whole church bow down our head with them and let's give them the opportunity before we partake of the communion. So can the whole church bow down our head, wherever you are, bow down your head, bow down your head. I'm going to help you to pray um, a prayer to receive Jesus into your, into your heart. I'm going to ask you to, to repeat this with me after me and let it be your own prayer. Let it be your own prayer. You need to make Jesus your Lord. That is what qualifies you. To, to, to partake of the Lord's table. And so would you pray this prayer after me and can the whole church help them to do so. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. And so Lord, have mercy on me and forgive me all my sins. I believe in my heart that Jesus came and died for my sins. 
And so today, I confess him as my Lord and personal Savior. Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Change my heart. Make me your child. Plant me in your house and help me to flourish from today. In Jesus' name. And if you have prayed this prayer sincerely, I can assure you on the authority of God's word that you are born again. The Bible says, if anyone be in Christ, is a new creature. Old, the old is gone and the new has come. I want you to stay in faith. Um, if you um, let write, write to us, let us know. And please, you are now qualified and you can partake of the communion together with us. And so can the ushers set these um, um, emblems, the, the, the bread and wine? As we receive it, prepare ourselves. Say the, uh, the emblem. I want you to just stay in the spirit and, and trust that every blessing we have received this month is coming upon your life. It's coming upon your life. It's coming upon your life. Surround me, O oh Lord. So long. So Father, we join in the example of the early church, and Jesus, we join in that example to obey you. You said we should do this in remembrance of you. And so, Lord, we bring our lives before you today as we break bread. We ask that you will sanctify these emblems we have in our hands, the bread, the wine, the wafer, the fruit juice, whatever it is that we have in our hands, here in this auditorium and across the face of this globe, wherever we are gathered via social media. We pray, Lord, 
that sanctify these emblems and let it minister the benefits that are associated with the body of Jesus Christ and with the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that as we partake of the communion, every blessing we have received this month will be released, Lord. Will be released, Lord. Will be released, Lord. To work on our behalf in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. And can you please look up? And so the Bible says, the Lord Jesus, the night on which he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And gave it to the disciples and told them to eat, and as they do, they shall remember him. Today, remember Jesus. He is the one who has planted us. He is the one who makes us flourish. He is the one who makes us break forth, burst out, spring up, and grow. And so as we partake of, of his body today, receive this grace upon your life. We are declaring that the hand of the Lord is coming upon us as a church. That as a local church, we will represent it. We will be a church that grows and that is healthy in the name of the Lord. And so I want you to please say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive today your body. As I partake of it, I receive life. I receive health. I receive strength. I declare that your grace is upon my life. And because of that, I will flourish like the palm tree and grow like the cedars of Lebanon. The body of the Lord Jesus, please take and eat. Similarly, after supper, the Bible said he took the cup and told the disciple, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, you do show forth my death until I come. I want you to receive this in faith in Jesus' mighty name. And say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive this wine as your blood. I declare that by your blood, I have life. I have strength. I have divine immunity. I declare my life is protected is and preserved from every attack of the devil. And I say finally that as you are, so am I. Your life is flowing through me. In Jesus' name I pray. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take and drink. Surround me, O oh Lord. Spend a few minutes to thank the Lord. Spend a few minutes to thank the Lord.